Bibles, take them to, uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew, chapter 11. That's our goal of the scripture for this study. We're going to continue our study with rest. Amen? Amen. And uh, we're going to be looking at stress this week. Last week we looked at, uh, we looked at fear. This week we're going to be looking at stress. But even before we get started, let us pray. Father God, we just come before your presence, Lord God. We just thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for what you're about ready to do. And Father, we lift up those families. We had a loved one who passed away. Our sister came home. I pray to be with you, Lord God. And we also lift up Pastor's mother, Lord God. He's in Birmingham, and we send our prayers that direction. But let your will be done and not ours, Father. You know the healing power. We pray that she receives you as Lord and Savior, and that she goes home to be in your bosom and at your feet. Now, heaven will come with me. But let Pastor, his wife, and family be encouraged as they go through this time of mourning and prayer and grievance. So we just thank you for the victory we have in you, Lord. And let the house say amen. 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 All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 28, down to 30, which is our golden text for us. Okay? And it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen? So, let us do a quick review. Our quick review is this. Last week we studied understanding fear. This week we're going to be studying uh, stress. And it's so happening that God made sure why I came stress-free. Well, y'all have no idea. I have been having a wonderful, wonderful stress-free week. All right, again, rest stands for rational, emotive, spiritual therapy. In uh, psychology, they call it RET, R-E-T, rational, emotive therapy. But Dr. Uh, McKinney, who created this uh, concepts and process, took it into the prisons as I once told you, and he calls it rest. Uh, rational emotive spiritual therapy. And we talked about the A, B, C, D equation, which we looked at when A represents the activating event, B represents our beliefs, C represents our consequences, feelings, which means our emotions, and then D represents what we do or our behavior or your behavior. But one of the things I, I was looking at, and I, I did put B into total concept, one of the things that will happen in your activating event is what you're going to be, believe about the activating event. I gave some demonstrations of it, but I didn't say that. I was putting more upon the spiritual replacement thought than letting you know that replacement thought also deals with what you believe is going on. Because your activating event is something, remember what I said? You can't do nothing about. You can't do nothing about somebody divorcing you. You can't do nothing about somebody walking up punch you. You can't do nothing about somebody want to break into your house and steal it, right? But, what is your belief about that event once it happens to you? Which will determine your emotion. Which will be, determine your behavior. And a lot of us have street knowledge. So we take the activating event, because we've been taught if somebody do X, Y, Z, we're supposed to react this way. Because we believe that's what we should do to show that we're tough. You know what I mean? And all that, okay? Or that we're street wise. But, it will lead to an emotional feeling which will cause a negative behavior. So now we're telling you to take the activating event, change your belief about it with our scripture replacement thought, then your emotions will change, and then your behavior will change. And that takes practice. Amen? That takes practice. And then we're going to start uh, learning how to T-E-R, which is trace, erase, replace. And I like to go to the root of the issue. Just covering the surface of issues ain't doing it. You know what I mean? Just covering the surface ain't doing it. Yeah. Find the root. And sometimes the root is way beyond when you first started acting up. It started, like I said, my root started at the age of two. But it took someone to talk me all the way back there to bring up all those deep emotions that were going on inside of me to bring up why I began to act out. I wasn't getting high at two. But it started at two, Come on. you know? I can remember a lot of things even in my brain all the way back to two years old. Then it causes what can happen is called a self-destructing thought. Okay? Because what we believe about the activating event will give us a self-destructive thought, which will cause our emotions to act up, which will make our behavior act negatively. Y'all understand? Okay. Then if we 
change our belief, then guess what we're going to change it with? Our SRT, our scripture replacement thought, because that negative thought only comes for a second. And if we replace that with something positive, guess what we will have? Our scripture replacement thought and our behavior will become positive. So we'll take the activating event that we can't do nothing about, change our belief about it with something that is positive to cause our emotions not to break out in, in negative behavior. Amen? Amen. I want y'all to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 22. And we want to look at this guy, David, because God was giving it to me. 1 Samuel chapter 22. I love David because David handled stress very well. We're going to look at a couple people in the Bible that I believe handle stress very well. I like to find characters in the Bible that also go through what we go through. Amen. Just so you know, you're not alone. Amen? Amen. 1 Samuel 22, starting at verses 1 and 2. And it said, David therefore departed this and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Oh, you wait till I can tell you about Adullam. And when his brother and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone that was in distress, there's your stress. They were in distress. And everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was in discontent, ooh, Man, I know y'all relate to just being discontent. Man. Gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with them about 400 men. Go back up to the verse 1 where it says, And David therefore departed this and escaped into a cave of Adullam. The reason why he ran into that cave because King Saul was chasing him and wanted to kill him. Yeah. If somebody tried to kill you, you get stressed, don't you? Yeah. If you ever had somebody who just had a vengeance against you or you wanted to get to him, you, you tiptoeing at the house. Now, the only way I can relate that to me is I didn't pay the drug dealer. Hmm. So, I, you know, I'm tiptoeing out the house, looking up and down the block because I need to go to work. And I know I got to pay him, too. And I know he carried big guns. Amen. You know, there's a few times they picked me up right outside the job, took me straight to the bank, and made me give them my paycheck. Wow. While I'm sitting in between two guys in the back of the car with pistols. Oh, okay. I've been there. But I made sure they got their money because I didn't want to come to my house messing up what? My family. That's stressful. It, you better know it. All right. So we want to look at David here. That cave of a doodle. So David escaped to the cave of a doodle. And the word for cave of a doodle means this. I like to put it like this. It's like this. It means the justice for the people or a testimony unto them to establish build and guide them. So God took that stress, pushed him in the cave because he was being uh, chased, right? And it taught him how to what? Build, God, and establish people who were what? In distress, in debt, and discontent. But David had to learn how to do that first in order to build them. Y'all ever seen the movie 300? Do y'all know a lot of that movie is based off of not only that out of the book of Judges with Gideon, but also with David's men. Because David killed giants, and he taught those men how to kill giants. He had some powerful boys with them, man, let me tell you. So he put him in that cave, and when he came out of that cave, he was able to what? Establish, build, and guide him because he made it through his stress. Now go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let's look at what he did. But watch this. Even the people you help sometimes get out of there. Amen. I love the dogs. The only church that dogs are walking around and eating the crumbs that fall off the table. Ain't that scripture? <laughs> All right, chapter 30. Let's start at verse uh, 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag, and on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziglag had smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captive that were therein. They slew not any. That means they ain't killed nobody. Right? Either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So they took them into slavery. Verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. Verse 4. Then David and the people that were with them lifted up their voices and wept. Grown men wept, crying. Amen. Amen. I don't know why we have a problem crying. Even these warriors crying. Why we have a problem crying? I don't have no idea. Now watch what I like this last part. He said, they lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever got to the place in your struggle where you wanted to cry and no tears were coming out? Amen. You have cried yourself empty. They had no 
how stressful they were over the situation. Verse 5, and David's two wives were taken captive, whatever her name is, and the church were like this, and Abigail, and the wife of the ball, and the uh, uh, Camelite, whatever her name is. Verse 6, this is what I want to look at. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Ain't that something? Like it was his fault. Well, David, we're going to kill you. They came and took our wives, our children, our sons, we're going to kill you. That's stressful. Amen. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughter. Now look what David's recipe for witness was. What that last part of verse say? But David did what? Encouraged himself in the Lord. He found himself a what? A scripture replacement. David said, you know what? I hear you, but I, I hear you, I see you. I'm going in here and encourage myself. When no one else will encourage you, you got to learn to encourage yourself. When they say nasty things about you, you got to reject it and encourage yourself. And no matter how they say it, negative thing as possible, you got to put a positive encouragement in yourself. Because the only way they write is if you believe what they say. Right? If I call you something and you believe it, guess how I know you believe it? You ready to fight. Okay. Right? Uh -oh. You ready to fight. But if I look at you and you call me something, I laugh. <laughs> I ain't believing you. Because I know who I am. I'm born in the cop. I'm a mighty man of power. I'm an heir. I'm a prince. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a minister of reconciliation. I'm a salt of the earth. Amen. 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 Look at all these things God calls you. Amen. So why should I believe you? <laughs> Amen. I'm going to encourage myself. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Then we're going to get into the book a little bit, okay? But ain't that powerful? I love how David just said, oh, y'all want to stop me? I just go on in here and encourage myself. But he was teaching them at the same time. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And we're going to read it all the way to 11. This is Paul. Ready? Because remember some of the little background. In chapter, in 1 Corinthians, he, Paul basically chewed them out. You know, he chewed them out well. He chewed them to the point that they were sad. He beat them down. That's why I hate it today that a lot of churches take what he said in 1 Corinthians out of context. Amen? Because if he meant that for all those churches, he would have wrote the same thing to them. Don't let women do this. Don't let men do that. Don't let children do this. But they were acting like a bunch of buckwild fools. You know, speaking in tongues, praying, prophesying, and then getting rid of no sin. Then they even kicked the guy out of the church for fornication. First they put up with it, not in fornication, because it was his father's wife who she was with. Paul said, put him out and turn him over to Satan. Then he comes back to the church, you know, repenting. Then they won't let him back in. Then Paul said, forgive him. Before he get totally stressed and the devil have control over him. What's wrong with you? How many of y'all been there? I've been put out before. Are they church? Sure? You know, been looked down. They don't get brother. You know? They don't call me all week to pray, but then they talk about me on Sunday when I arrive. Hello. I'm trying to reach out and say, hey man, I need help. And here you are want to talk about me, don't want to lay hands on you, don't want to pray. I won't be here. But let's start at verse one. I don't want to get too heavy with right that. <laughs> Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 But I determined this with myself That I would not come again to you In heaviness See, he's writing to let you know First chapter, I mean chapter 1 I mean chapter 1 Corinthians He came to them hard But he let them know now this one I'm going to bring some love to you uh, I'm not going to come to you with heaviness For I make you sorry Who is he did that maketh me glad But the same which has made me sorry By me and I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. See, you let them know. I don't want sorrow from you. I started this church. I want to rejoice in you. Amen? Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of the heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. See that? He said, I wrote this thing with many tears. <laughs> Sometimes the person rebuking you is the person who's loving you. Sometimes the person who's correcting you and steering you the right way, you may not think so, because we're not going to agree with you, 
negativity. You bring negativity too. We want to set you straight. We love you. Okay. Amen. Amen. Let's finish that out. Verse 4 4. Out of much affliction and anguish of the heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. That don't speak to before I was saying it, huh? But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. If that word overcharge you, I'm not going to make all of you responsible. Amen? Verse 6. Sufficient to the such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that contrary wise, here's the guy I'm talking about. I had to look through in the background books to figure out he was talking about this guy in 1 Corinthians who said, forgive me for sleeping with my father's wife. So verse 7 tells the story, right? He says now, so that contrary wise, you are rather to forgive him and comfort him. Lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Amen. Now forgive him. He repented. He turned around. Let him back in. Amen. 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 Verse 8. Wherefore I beseech you that you will confirm your love toward him. Tell me you're loving him again. Let him back in the church. Who else ever had a mistake? Come on. For, for uh, excuse me, verse 9. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive, forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of whom? Christ. Now watch this last verse. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his what? Devices. Satan can't handle forgiveness. Satan can't handle love. He wants to keep you in a hard and hard condition. He wants to keep you in unforgiveness. He wants to keep you walking out of love. Because in that way, it don't hinder the person you're not forgiven. It don't hinder the person you're not loving. It hinders you. It keeps you in bondage. It stresses you out. Hey, man, you don't know what they did to me. Well, let it go. I say it's a cheap price when somebody ripped me off. Don't try it. <laughs> but it's a cheap price. That was a cheap price. Three bucks, five bucks, ten bucks, hundred bucks. Cheap. Because you're going to miss much, much more. Because I know now you ain't going to come to me and ask me for another penny. You see me coming, you go the other direction. Amen. Well, God bless you. I've had that happen too. In the church. Got ripped off for a thousand by a Christian woman. Amen. And my first activating event was to what? By my belief after being wise and girl said, I'm going to go burn down her house. Amen. But thank God I had a good pastor who told me, don't do that. Forgive her. Forgive her. Pray for her. Pray for her. Are you crazy? I got a thousand dollars. But guess what I did do? I obeyed him and I prayed for him until God removed her out of my prayer. Two years later, she came back to the church and she couldn't look me in the face and had to leave the same day. Coals of fire. Part of her head. Amen. I want to get you heavy in that story. Now, let's read some stuff about stress in the book. Ready? Understanding stress. When something uh, significant happens to us, we have what is called a critical internal response. One such critical response is our eternal reaction to things we perceive as danger. Our emergency switch is turned on, and our body, mind, and emotions get ready to fight or flight. This perceived danger produces stress. Both our mind and body response to stressful situations our digestive system is one of the systems turned off by stress. Well, how y'all know y'all going you don't want to eat when you're stressed out? Person make you mad, you know, I ain't going to eat. See, it affects you, man. It affects you. Some people lose their appetite, can't sleep, or think straight under too much stress. Science also has documented that stress interferes with the immune system. Here's another one that I'm telling you, man, the chemicals that go on in our body by the way we think is amazing. It's amazing. Therefore, it is much easier for us to get sick or catch a common cold, common cold when we are under stress. Our immune system 
is our defense team that protects and fights all invaders like bacteria and viruses, from minor infections to cancer. Science has proven that there is a direct relationship between stress and illness, mental and emotional, and disease in the body. So, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, that's ill health. Ill health can result from a person being under too much stress at one time, continued stress over a long period of time, or the stress emergency system being used too often. Stressful situations can also lead to other negative emotions such as anxiety. When suffering uh, anxiety, many persons drink, smoke cigarettes, or take illegal drugs to cope with stress, self-medicate themselves. In some cases, persons under too much stress need medical attention from the physician who prescribes medicine designed to decrease the negative effects of stress. Many of these drugs are addicting, and we see that now. What is it called? Bipolar disorder. You're not calling it an addict no more. You're called an addict for six months. Then when they put you in a program, after six months you have a relapse. The state don't want to pay for it no more. So now the doctors and all the medical uh, and, and, and the rehab clinics that are not Christian diagnose you as bipolar disorder. So now they drug you in the drug addict. So they're giving you all these depressive drugs that you ain't never want. You ain't never looked for, ain't never even asked for. All you did was smoke some weed, drink some alcohol. Now they want to give you all these different chemicals that'll make you think, go kill yourself. You know why? Because it's getting rich off the system. They want to keep the money flowing. So now you're a guinea pig. Hello. I ain't being nobody's guinea pig no more. Why you want to drug a drug addict? How you want to drug an alcohol? It don't make sense to me. But to keep the money flowing, that's what they do. What so they mean by relapse? They, they, that's what they do. They wait for you to relapse. The state says, I'll pay for you for six months. If you relapse, that's it. I ain't paying for you no more. Now they put you in the hospital and say, now you're mentally ill. We call you a uh, bipolar disorder. Now I can get you all the drugs you want. <laughs> Welcome. That's what they filled it with today. Believe me, I've been going to these places and ministering to folks. All right, definitions. A general definition states that stress is a symptom which reflects a conflict with some aspects of a person's environment. Conflict meaning that something, for some reason, is threatening to the person at the given time. Our psychological, I mean, in, psycholo in psychology, stress is any event or situation that makes heightened demands on a person's <coughs> mental or emotional resources. Science has proven that street drugs create eternal, internal stress to the mind and the body. Street drugs, they heighten that stuff, man. Here are some important facts about stress. Stress has been uh, projected as a major disorder for this century. Stress can be triggered by almost any situation that is overworked, marital problems, difficulties at work, negative family relationships, Poor living conditions, drug and alcohol use, to name a few. Stress can cause or agitate all physical illness, including uh, per, uh, uh, what is that? Paralysis, uh, emphysema, uh, ulcers, asthma, etc. Ain't that something? Stress decreases the effectiveness of the immune system, thereby increasing the person's susceptibility to all kinds of diseases and illness. Stress causes extreme, one-sided, absolutic, I've never heard that word, absolutic thinking, and uh, global judgments. What is absolute thinking? I bet a few of y'all who have absolute one thinking. Point. Huh? You can only say one point. Damn! Thank you, brother Harold. No one can tell you nothing. They try to open your eyes, you ain't believing nothing. Absolutely thinking. That's it. Amen. I like that my, my first wife would come, you're the most intelligent, stupid man I've ever met in my life. Absolutely thinking. Because all I was trying to do was figure out how to get high the next day. And she was going to hinder that. Absolutely thinking. Amen. My plan was to come home and start an argument every day. So I can absolutely think my way out of the house. To absolutely get myself totally high. So I can absolutely go broke. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> 